invitation and go home. <laughs> Jesus said, except you become as a little child, you'll never have the kingdom of heaven. Well, um, before I went on vacation, I, uh, I, I, I preached from the 24th chapter of Matthew uh, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will, will wax cold. And uh, in that sermon, we shined a light on the wickedness of our land, and but we gained hope and inspiration from Christ's promise that those who persevere to the end will be saved. And we, were, we found that even in a dark situation, it's inspiring. Well, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little surprised, but the Lord has led me to kind of a similar passage, but with, uh, with really different instructions. And so uh, today, I want to talk to you about breaking up your fallow ground and whatever. Now here's the setting. We have, to, we have to catch the setting to fully appreciate the verse. I'm reading from Jeremiah, and I'm reading from the prophet Hosea. And the time is somewhere between uh, 700 and 550 B.C. It is before Israel was overrun by the Assyrians in, I think it was 776 B.C., and before the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. But it's in that time frame where these two uh, prophets spoke. Now, Judah and Israel are long past their golden age. Both of the governments are utterly corrupt. And furthermore, uh, Israel has sunk deep into idolatry. Now, Israel is the northern kingdom. Um, what has happened, um, oh, what, Jeroboam uh, made a big golden cow, and they were, they were worshiping that, and there was little or no understanding or worship of, of the true God that brought those people back out of Egypt. Uh, Judah uh, has gone to the point where they aren't, they aren't fully idolatrous, but what they've done is they've taken the worship of God and they've mixed it with the worship of idols. It's called syncretism. And they put, it, they put those things together. And of course, you know, we're breaking the commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me and, and, uh, and whatever. Um, the leaders are sinful. Uh, the priests are sinful. The people are sinful. And the prophets here are calling this very sinful group of people to repentance, okay? And I want to pick up just a couple of short clips from, the, uh, from these prophecies. Jeremiah says to them, For thus says the Lord to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Notice who he's talking to, Judah and Jerusalem. Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Or else my wrath will go forth like fire and burn with no one to quench it because of your evil doings. Now Hosea is speaking to Israel. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it's time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness on you. Okay? So we have this theme of breaking up your fallow ground. Now, we need to catch some symbolism and just say some things intentionally. Uh, throughout the Bible, ground is the hearts of people. Uh, the seed is the word of God, and fruit is the actions that result from what's in a person's heart. 
Now, uh, when I say that to you, you ought to have about three or four or five uh, parables that Jesus gave uh, of the same thing. And uh, this, this theme uh, runs through the Bible. Uh, fallow ground is ground that has been taken out of production. Now, when we start talking about that, uh, there are reasons for doing it. For instance, you'll read that every seven years, the Israelites were supposed to take their ground, pull it out of production, and let the ground rest. Okay? Uh, and that's, and that, that rejuvenates it. We know, in fact, there are times farmers need to pull their ground out of production just to, res just to uh, restore the fertility. Now, that's the thing. However, if ground is left um, un, uh, unplowed, undone, and whatever for a period of time, uh, it becomes uh, difficult and hard to work. Uh, when we were living in southern Indiana, uh, we had uh, yellow clay soil. And I remember we had a little patch of, uh, you know, between the sidewalk and the porch. And I tried to spade it up with my, with my spade. And I found out I didn't need a spade, I needed a trowel, you know. It was... <clears throat> Lucy, Lucy grew up, her dad and mom always had a big garden. I grew up on concrete and she tried to make a garden out of it. <laughs> Well, anyhow, we headed out there. We were going to spade up the garden. And I'm not kidding you. It just went clunk. Now, the, the, the ground where our house was built had been a pasture for years. And, of course, with that yellow clay, you know what it was. So what I did, I found a guy who had uh, one of those tractors that have the rototiller on the back. Big old honking tractor with the rototiller and told him where I wanted to till the thing and and he got there and he dropped that rototiller on it and he started going and he goes, Whoa, the tractor just bogged down stuff. And I'm telling you, it it hit boom, 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 you know. He had to work that, he had to go over that at least three or four times just to break that soil up so that we could plant a garden, okay? Now, that's the picture of the people's hearts that God is trying to get across, okay? Now, in southern Indiana, where we had a lot of that, I don't see it so much up here, I don't hear about it at least, but again, we live in a rural area similar to here, a lot of of uh, cash grade farming, mostly corn, and trying to, because of the clay, compaction was a real problem. And so the, uh, we had to run, farmers regularly had to run subsoilers through. Well, what's a subsoiler? Well, it's a, it's a piece of steel about that big, and about that big around, it's got a spade on the end of it, and they take that thing and they dry and they get it into the ground on the back of the truck on the back of the tractor and they pull it through and break up that hard pan that's underneath. Okay? Takes a lot of work. That's the picture that we're trying to get of people's hearts. Okay? Now, when we say when we take that, it's been taken out of production. Um, now he says. Break up your fallow ground and don't sow among thorns. Now, our hearts tend to get hard, especially as we get older. I've been through one too many battles. I've been insulted one too many times. I've been hurt too often. And one of the things that we do, we protect ourselves and our hearts become hard and we're not open so that when those slings and arrows come, 
We just blow them off. <coughs> we isolate ourselves. We protect ourselves. Especially those of us who are older. <coughs> when I was younger, you know, I, I didn't think about it, but as I'm older, believe me, I think about it now. Come to a point where we just don't care. I'm tired of caring because every time I get, every time I care, I just get hurt worse. That's right. Okay. Wow. Now, when I say that and I call it, please understand that it's a result of things. It's a result. Of our hearts really do tend to become hard to protect our emotions. The second thing that we have is that thorns are the care of life and the deceitfulness of riches. We get this from four types of ground. And he says, break up your fallow ground. Don't sow among thorns. I spent almost my entire vacation fixing things. That's what vacations are for. <laughs> got to do this. Got to do And the reason why I did it is because, uh, you know, when I'm preaching and whatever, I, I, I just have to give priority to other things. And, you know, that, that's what you do. The cares of life. Oh my. My spouting isn't spouting. It's running behind it. It's ruining my lawn. It's ruining my driveway. Oh my. Got to get the dog to the vet. Oh my. Got to pick the kids up at school. <laughs> Oh my, i got to get supper fixed and I haven't got a clue what I'm going to fix. Everybody looking at me and saying, yeah, Pastor John's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Yeah. Right? Come on. Come on. You know? Cares of life. I mean, uh, I, I, I can tell you, I've come to a point in my life where it seems like just living is hard. Just living. Now when you throw on to that, the deceitfulness of riches. Um, we think that if we just had one more dollar, it'd make us happy. <clears throat> I got a lesson this week. I had a funeral yesterday, and um, the lady that I had was, you know, as I do, I work with the families ahead of time, and, and I was talking to one of the daughters, and I said, well, what was it like growing up? And she said, we were poor, but we didn't know it. We were happy. And I said, you mean you really weren't poor? You just didn't have it. As we get older, and especially as we've struggled with debt, sometimes gotten into debt and for stupid reasons, uh, we get there and struggling with it and whatever, we begin to search and serve money. Jesus said, now wait a minute. I'll tell you something. You can't serve God and money. You serve God or you serve money, but you can't serve both. And so when we start, start talking about sowing among thorns, if you sow seed, you're expecting a crop from what goes. And if you're throwing, sowing your seed among the, the, uh, the uh, cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches, you're not going to be spiritual. In fact, what will happen with all of that is, is you will become more hard-hearted. And what happens is, is, is we go along and, and we all of a sudden, well, uh, you know, 
I'm tired this morning. I don't think I'll go to church. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't need to read my Bible every day. Uh, you know, been months since I prayed, really prayed. Seems like the only time I pray now is when I'm in trouble. That's what happens when you sow, when you put your investment in the cares of life and riches. He says, now I want you to do something. I want you to break up your fallow ground, but don't sow it among the thorns. Put it on the good ground where it will bring forth a good crop. Right? That's the first thing that the, that the prophet tells us. Let me go back to this point. Sowing among thorns, that activity will be fruitless because of the competition. Charlie's a run farms all his life. And he'll tell you the reason why we have to keep our garden weeded is because the weeds are in competition with the good plants. They take valuable water, <laughs> valuable minerals, and shade the sunlight, and the other plants don't bear fruit. That's what Jesus was saying when you're sowing among the thorns. And our problem is if we get too many things competing in our life for our spirituality, for our love for God, and for all those things, So, don't do it. Next thing he says is circumcise yourself to the Lord. Now, circumcised, circumcision was a symbol of the covenant between God and the Jews. Uh, you can read it over in Genesis 17 where uh, God said to Abraham, listen, I'm going to make a covenant between you, uh, you and I, and as a, as a, uh, a symbol between this, uh, you're to circumcise every male on the eighth day. And so circumcision becomes a symbol of the covenant between God and his people. Okay? And he says here, circumcise yourself to the Lord. He's saying here, let's renew that covenant. Let's think about making a covenant if we haven't had one. That covenant, you know, where we said, if you'll forgive my sins, uh, uh, I, will, I will follow your law. God says, if you become my, my child and obey my laws, I'll be your God. And I'll be your provider. I'll be your protector. I'll be your salvation. That's a covenant. And the problem with covenants are that they have to be renewed every now and then, or we just get a little sloppy in, in observing them. And he says... Circumcise your heart to the Lord. Renew that covenant. The next thing he says is take away the foreskin of your heart. Now, uh, the foreskin, when you take away the foreskin, it makes one's most private parts sensitive to the slightest irritation. There's a story in the book of Genesis about a group of people who wanted to join uh, Jacob's tribe. And they, got, and they wanted, wanted to marry uh, one of his daughters, Dinah. And the boy said, well, yeah, you can do that, but you've got to become like us. And so all the guys went out and circumcised themselves. And while they were still sore, they went in and they slaughtered all the men. They couldn't fight. Okay? Now, it's painful. You become highly sensitive. Now, we've already talked about as we get older, we take our heart and we put things there and we cover things and we do things to protect us and whatever. And God's saying, no. No. If we're, gonna, if we're going to serve God, 
then when you come to rip that foreskin away, and we've got to be in that place where it hurts. Take away the foreskin of your heart. Life does bring hearts with it. Now, the next question, and a reasonable one, how is this done? If you read the context and what he says here, the answer is repent. Now the problem that we have with this verb, this word repentance is we want to put it off on the sinners, the people who haven't accepted Jesus Christ as our as their Lord and Savior. We're going to say, repent, believe the gospel, you know, repent, repent, repent. He wasn't talking to people that weren't his people. He was talking to his people. And I can tell you, as one who has been a Christian for a number of years now, there has to be times and there will be times in our lives where God brings us to a place where we have to repent. Amen. <clears throat> now, when we start talking about repentance, we're talking about a change of heart towards sin. Repentance in one sense means you're walking one way and you repent and you turn around and you walk the other way. But the reason for turning around has to do with a change of mind and a change of heart. It's not about behavior, it's about an internal change that results in behavior. This is the problem with too many people uh, that we have today, the easy, easy believism, easy receivism, is that, oh yes, I believe Jesus is, is uh, uh, the Son of God, He was there, uh, yeah, He's my Savior, and so I'm saved, and nothing happens inside, and so what we do, we think we've got our ticket punched to heaven, and we never change. Now we Christians can get arrogant, we can become spiritually proud. <laughs> Has anybody around here ever seen spiritual pride? I was among some people that they wouldn't wear jewelry. Not at all. I, they wore jewelry. Anybody wore jewelry? They were on their way to hell. Okay? And they were humble and proud of it. But some of them were the biggest gossips in town. Quit shaking your head around there. You folks have been to churches like that before, haven't you? <laughs> no. What happens is, is as we mature, we begin to see things about sin that we couldn't see before. Now stop and think about it. As a teenager, we've got a view of life and we understand some things, but as we mature, we begin to learn some other things. Hopefully, we don't have a bunch of adolescent Christians running around here. Uh, we've got people who are mature and have begun to see sin in ways that we couldn't when we were immature. Okay? It, it's just a group. But it does require a change of heart towards sin. Now, here's where we tie in with what the setting was with what we're talking about. Sin is so prevalent, we have become hardened to it. How many of you, when you're watching TV and somebody says, hell or damn, even notice it? People, well, they just talk like that. Why, you get interviews on sports, and, and, I, and, and I wonder, where's the ghost of Red Barber? Red Barber, uh, one of the premier pioneer baseball announcers, Red Barber would not swear, period. He said, I won't swear 
because I might get excited to say something that I shouldn't say. We get harder to see. There's just as much of it around. As I reflected on this, I began to ask myself the question, how, how is it that we get hardened to sin? How, how do we get hardened to it? You know? We, 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 uh, we just do it. And my, my reaction, as I reflected on it, I believe it's because sin doesn't, we don't think about the consequences of even the slightest sin. If you begin to reflect on the consequences of sin, and I'm not just talking about uh, the, the people who may commit sin, uh, I can, we can talk about systemic uh, evil in uh, uh, public institutions, we can talk about uh, oh, uh, sin in a general sense. If we begin to reflect on what happens because of it, just an example from the Bible. God said to Adam, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. The day you eat of it, you're going to die. They did. And from that one act of disobedience, we have the world of war and uh, human trafficking and prostitution and alcoholism, and drug addiction, and murder, and rape, and all of that came because one woman looked at it, saw it's good for fruit, and it's going to make me like God, so I'm going to take it. Now, I want to ask you something. What makes you think that when you eat forbidden fruit, that we're not going to have similar consequences. But boy, no. Craig, it's, it's just a little thing, just a little picking down. Doesn't mean anything. Really? And so what happens is our hearts become hard because we won't focus on the consequences of sin. The text calls for us to become so sensitive to sin that we hate what God hates. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be real transparent here. I'm not sure I hate sin like God does. Why are you being so transparent, Pastor John? Because I'm going to be honest about it. I think I've got some work to do. You think you're on your way to hell? No. But I think I've been through enough and I've seen enough that my heart has gotten hard enough that I don't hate sin anymore. I just kind of tolerate it. Alexander Pope said this. Sin is a monster of such frightful mean. That word mean means that your actions dis uh, display your character. Sin is a monster of so frightful mean as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too all familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. I tacked that on my bulletin board when I was in college. What? Just so much sin around. Mm. Well, <laughs> what are we going to do? I believe God is calling us.
us to repent of our casual attitude towards sin. We need to break up our fallow ground and take away the foreskin of our heart. We need to begin to feel about this stuff again. Okay? We need to feel about it. Uh, we need to renew our covenant with God. We're, we're going to take communion here in just a few minutes, and that is a time of covenant <coughs> renewal. I think also we need to become sensitive again to the love and the leading of God. We can become so, uh, you know, I can do this. <laughs> We've got toddlers at our house. Me do it. I want to do it. Let me pour it. All over the floor. <laughs> But we have become so self-sufficient that all of a sudden we don't sense the love of God, nor do we feel the love towards Him that we do. And the same way with His leading. How often do we need to hear that still small voice that says, Go here, go there. Those are things that we have. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I've done my best to share with the people, with your, your people, what you've laid on our hearts. Father, I just hear your love for us dripping through this entire uh, discourse. You're trying to say something to us. You're not angry at all. What you want is you want us to become better. And you're saying, I've got more in store from you, for you. You're going to be more fruitful. You're going to be more effective. You're going to have more peace in your family, in your church. You're going to have more peace in your community. But I need you to break up your valor ground, to circumcise yourself to take away the foreskin of your heart. Father, all we can promise is that we intend to do it and we'll do our best. Lord, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand. We're going to change the song.